If you look at a map of North America, your eyes will likely drift toward massive features like the Great Lakes, the Great Plains, or the Rockies. But if you zoom in on the southwestern edge of the continent, you'll see something that looks almost like a mistake. A long, jagged tear separating the Mexican mainland from a slender finger of land that seems like it's trying to escape into the Pacific Ocean. This is the Gulf of California, and while it might look like a simple geographic feature on a map, the reality of what this body of water actually is, and what happens beneath its surface, is one of the most volatile and misunderstood topics in North American geography. Physically, the Gulf of California, also known as the Sea of Cortez, is immense. It stretches over 700 miles from the mouth of the Colorado River in the north to the Pacific in the south. To put that in perspective, that is roughly the distance from New York City to Atlanta, Georgia. It varies in width from about 30 to 150 miles, bordered by the Mexican states of Sonora and Sinaloa to the east and the Baja California Peninsula to the west. But while its physical geography is interesting, there's a bigger question here. Why does this water body exist in the first place? This is where the geography gets violent. The Gulf sits directly on top of a boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. And millions of years ago, the Baja Peninsula was glued to the Mexican mainland. But tectonic forces began to unzip the continent, dragging Baja northwest and opening up a massive rift valley that the ocean rushed in to fill. But here's the first thing you need to realize. That process isn't finished. The Gulf of California is actually a baby ocean. As the San Andreas Fault continues to drag Baja towards Alaska, the Gulf is slowly widening. In a few million years, the Gulf won't just be a sea. It will likely tear California apart, turning cities like Los Angeles into island real estate. But we don't have to wait millions of years for the Gulf to cause trouble. It's doing plenty of that right now. Because of this unique tectonic origin, the Gulf is incredibly deep, plunging over 3,000 meters in some basins. Yet it's also home to some of the most extreme tides on the planet. In the northern reaches, the water level can swing by as much as 30 feet between low and high tide. These massive tidal fluxes churn up nutrients from the deep, creating one of the most biologically productive marine ecosystems on Earth. Famous oceanographer Jacques Cousteau once called it the world's aquarium because it hosts nearly 900 species of fish and about one third of the world's marine mammal species. However, looking at the vibrant blue water hides a much dustier, uglier reality at the very top of the Gulf. This brings us to the most contentious geographic issue in the region, the Colorado River Delta. Geographically, this should be a massive, flourishing estuary where the mighty Colorado River, having carved the Grand Canyon, finishes its journey by mixing fresh water with the salty sea. Historically, it was exactly that, a lush green labyrinth of wetlands covering over 2 million acres, teeming with jaguars, deer, and millions of migratory birds. Today, if you look at satellite imagery of the northern gulf, you won't see a river. You'll see a dried, cracked, salt flat. The Colorado River effectively dies before it ever reaches the ocean. The geography of the gulf has been fundamentally broken by human engineering upstream. Through the construction of massive dams like the Hoover and Glen Canyon in the United States, and the diverting of water for agriculture in the Imperial Valley and cities like Phoenix and Las Vegas, the river has been strangled. This has turned the northern tip of the Gulf of California into an environmental disaster zone. Without the influx of fresh water, the salinity of the upper gulf has spiked, devastating local species like the vaquita porpoise, the world's rarest marine mammal, which is currently teetering on the brink of extinction with as few as a dozen individuals left. But here's where things get strange. Occasionally, the water does come back. In 2014, a geopolitical experiment called a pulse flow released water from the U.S. dam specifically to reach the sea. For a brief, fleeting moment, the geography reverted to its natural state. Children in San Luis Rio, Colorado, played in water where they usually played in sand. The Green Delta bloomed again, proving that the geography isn't dead, it's just being held hostage. And who's holding it hostage? Well, that's usually the United States. But that dynamic is shifting. While the US controls the tap water for the fresh water entering the system, Mexico controls the salt water. And Mexico is beginning to realize that the Gulf of California isn't just a tourist destination for Americans driving down to Cabo. It's a strategic asset that could completely undermine the economic dominance of the US West Coast. Most people assume the Gulf is international waters because it's so wide, but it's not. It's governed by a very specific and very aggressive set of maritime laws that Mexico has leveraged to turn this body of water into a private fortress. To understand how they did that and why the US let them, we have to look back at how this strange peninsula got its name in the first place and the centuries long confusion that led map makers to believe that California wasn't attached to North America at all. Nations fight over resources because access is everything. 
And on a much smaller scale, that's exactly why I use today's sponsor, HelloFresh. When I get back from traveling for GLX videos, I definitely don't have access to a stocked fridge. It's usually just some condiments and maybe some spoiled milk. Now, I wanna start eating healthier at home, but between working on these videos and traveling, that's a huge challenge. I also hate meal planning and grocery shopping, but HelloFresh solved both of those problems for me. It gives me a middle ground that actually works. And instead of ordering takeout every night, I get fresh, pre-proportioned meals delivered straight to my door. And also, HelloFresh recipes take 30 minutes to make or less, which is honestly faster than waiting for delivery. And while other meal kits only give me a few choices, HelloFresh gives me over 100 weekly options. Lately, I've been focusing on their high protein options because it's a great way to stay fueled during long recording days. And because I travel a lot, I can skip, pause, or swap out meals entirely on a whim. There's no commitment and no pressure. So click the link in the description below or use my code, Jeff HFZWL, to get a free Zwilling four-star chef's knife on your third box, plus 10 free meals. And to top it off, your first box ships free. And seriously, this knife is no joke. I've been using it to prep this entire meal right now. It is extremely high quality. Make sure to use my code to get this deal before supplies run out. The offer is only valid while the supplies last, but my link below will automatically opt you into HelloFresh's best active deal, even if you're redeeming after the activations offer. So check out the link in the description below and big thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. Now, HelloFresh delivers exactly what you expect, but for over 200 years, European map makers delivered the exact opposite. They told the world that California was an island, not because of science, but because of a fantasy novel. For nearly two centuries, if you bought a map in Europe, it would show California not as part of the North American mainland, but as a massive island floating off the coast. This is one of the most famous and persistent cartographic errors in human history, and the reason for this mistake, and the name of California itself, isn't rooted in exploration or science. It's rooted in a romance novel. In the early 1500s, a Spanish author named Garci Rodriguez de Montalvo wrote a fantasy novel called La Sergas de Esplendian. In this book, he described a mythical place called California, an island rich in gold and precious stones, inhabited by a race of Amazonian women and ruled by a queen named Calafia. When Spanish conquistadors, led by Hernan Cortes, arrived in the Baja Peninsula in the 1530s, they didn't find Amazonian warriors, but they did find pearls. Believing they had stumbled upon Montalvo's mythical land, they applied the name California to the peninsula. But because they hadn't sailed all the way north to the river delta, they assumed the water would continue upward separating Baja entirely from the continent. Cortes named the body of water the Sea of Cortes, a name that sticks around today, though the Mexican government officially prefers the Gulf of California. But the confusion about the geography had real consequences. In 1539, an explorer named Francisco de Uloa actually sailed all the way to the northern terminus of the Gulf, proving that Baja was a peninsula. He saw the delta, he saw the land connection, he proved definitively that California was attached to North America. Maps were corrected, and for a few decades, the world knew the truth. But then, something bizarre happened. In the early 1600s, Spanish explorers sailing up the Pacific coast claimed to have found the Straits of Anian, the legendary Northwest Passage. Through a game of telephone and bad intel, the idea that California was an island resurfaced. It appeared on a map in 1622, and suddenly, the error went viral. For the next hundred years, despite evidence to the contrary, California was drawn as an island. King Ferdinand VI of Spain had to issue a royal decree in 1747, over two centuries after the discovery, officially proclaiming California is not an island. While the Europeans were bickering over maps, the actual history of the Gulf was being written by the people living there. For thousands of years, the Gulf was the lifeline for the indigenous peoples of the region. The Cucupa in the Delta, the Seri along the Sonoran coast, and the Cochimi in Baja. The Seri people in particular have a fascinating relationship with the Gulf. Living in one of the harshest deserts on earth, 
the Sonoran Desert, they turned entirely to the sea for survival. They became masters of the Gulf, navigating its treacherous currents in reed boats, hunting sea turtles, and surviving on Tiburon Island, the largest island in the Gulf. Now, Tiburon Island is a place that feels prehistoric. It's rugged, dry, and fiercely protected. Today, it remains governed by the Seri people, effectively operating as a semi-autonomous zone within Mexico. It serves as a reminder that while European powers were drawing imaginary islands on maps, distinct civilizations were mastering the reality of the Gulf's true geography. But as the Spanish solidified their hold on New Spain, the Gulf became a highway for missionaries. Jesuit priests established a chain of missions along the rugged Baja coastline. They weren't just churches, they were logistical hubs designed to secure the territory for Spain against British and Russian encroachment. The difficulty of traversing the Gulf, known for its sudden violent storms called Chubascos, meant that Baja remained isolated. It was the forgotten peninsula. Even after the Mexican-American War in 1848, when the United States swallowed up Alta California, which is modern-day California, Nevada, Arizona, and more, they left Baja behind. Why? Because the negotiators looked at the map and saw a desert peninsula with no water and a jagged mountain range. The United States thought it was worthless. That was a massive miscalculation. By drawing a border in a straight line from the Colorado River, the United States accidentally gave Mexico one of the most powerful geopolitical advantages in the 21st century. They gave Mexico total control over the mouth of the Colorado River and, crucially, the entirety of the Gulf of California. If the U.S. had taken Baja, the Gulf would be international waters shared between both countries. Instead, Mexico owns both shores. And because they own both shores, they've been able to pull off a legal maneuver that effectively locks the entire sea down as their private property. The border drawn in 1848, which left Baja California in Mexican hands, is the single most significant geographic advantage Mexico possesses today. By failing to annex the peninsula, the United States created a geographic anomaly. It allowed a single country to completely envelop a sea the size of the Adriatic. And Mexico has not let that opportunity go to waste. This brings us to the first reason why the Gulf is vastly more important than you realize a legal maneuver known as the Internal Waters Designation. Under standard international maritime law, a country usually controls 12 nautical miles off the coast as sovereign territory. Beyond that, up to 200 miles, is an exclusive economic zone. But the middle of a wide body of water is usually high seas, international waters where anyone can transit, fish, or generally do anything. Mexico looked at the Gulf of California, which is wider than 24 miles in most places, and realized that under standard rules, the middle stripe would be international water. And they said, no thanks. Because they control both the peninsula to the west and the mainland to the east, and crucially, the islands that guard the mouth of the Gulf in the south, Mexico legally classified the entire body of water as internal waters. This is a massive distinction. It means that the Gulf of California is legally no different than a lake in the middle of Chihuahua or the Rio Grande River. It's sovereign Mexican territory. There's no right of innocent passage here. Foreign warships cannot enter without explicit permission. And it is, effectively, a private maritime fortress guarded by geography. Why does Mexico need a private sea? To build an economic engine that could bypass the United States entirely. For decades now, the entry point for Asian goods into North America has been Southern California. The ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach handle an enormous percentage of US imports. They are the choke point of the American economy. If they clog up, as we saw during the pandemic, the whole system fails. Mexico sees this vulnerability as an opportunity. They are actively developing what is sometimes called the California Bypass. By expanding ports inside the Gulf, like Guaymas in Sonora, and connecting them via modernized rail lines directly up into Arizona and Texas, Mexico is creating a back door into the American heartland. Asian cargo ships could sail right past California, dock in the secure internal waters of Mexico, and have their containers on trains heading to Chicago faster and potentially cheaper than waiting in line off the coast of LA. The geography of the Gulf makes it the perfect alternative logistics hub for North America. But it's not just about moving other people's stuff. The Gulf is about to become the epicenter of the future energy economy. If you drive along the Sonoran coast on the eastern side of the Gulf, you are driving over what investors call white gold. This is Mexico's lithium valley. As the world transitions to electric vehicles and electric everything, lithium has become one of the most strategic resources on the planet, and Sonora sits on massive reserves of lithium clay deposits. While extracting lithium from clay is technically challenging compared to brine pumping in South America, the sheer scale of the deposits is staggering. As such, the Mexican government has launched 
plan Sonora, nationalizing the lithium reserves and aiming to turn the region surrounding the Gulf into a green energy powerhouse, building massive solar farms and battery manufacturing facilities. The Gulf provides the necessary cooling water for power plants and the maritime transport links to ship these batteries globally. All of this combined makes the Gulf of California one of North America's most strategically important geographic features, even if we don't think much of it today. So, when you look at the Gulf of California, don't just see a beautiful place to drink a margarita and watch whales. See a broken ecosystem at the Delta struggling to survive American thirst. See a historic cartographic mistake that created a unique geopolitical reality. And of course, see a sleeping giant of economic power. Speaking of dry, dusty places, this week I'm in Morocco, traveling along Africa's only high-speed rail connecting Casablanca and Tangier. And if that sounds interesting to you, come join me over on my travel channel. I hope you enjoyed learning all about the Gulf of California. If you did, be sure to check out this video all about the United States forgotten Pacific Island territory. Thanks for watching. See you next week.